Okay, we are ready to start. Thank you guys for showing up. This is going to be our panel discussion on institutional racism here in the U.S. This is a follow up to the behavior analysis uh, on institutional racism in the U.S. that we did last week. Um, it's a response to this video on the on the presentation. And we're just going to have our panelists come in and we're going to ask them some questions on this subject um, and get their take on it. And we're going to keep rocking. I want to introduce everyone here today. I want to actually bring you guys up for you to speak and introduce yourselves and tell everyone, you know, why you're here and what you bring to the subject and the discussion. I'm going to go ahead and start with Dr. Brent Meyer. Okay. So hello, everyone. I'm Brent Meyer. Uh, I'm a sociologist. I've been, um, I teach at Central Methodist University. Uh, yeah, that's where I met Shamika. Uh, and um, uh, I don't know if I'm an expert in race. Uh, I'm certainly not, but I do teach it uh, at Central Methodist and have for about 18 years. So maybe I can say something uh, that's interesting. Let's hope. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Meyer. And he is really educated and he knows his stuff. So I think you're pretty qualified. All right, I wanna go over to Deshaun. Hi, I'm Deshaun. I um, went to Central Methodist for my bachelor's in vocal performance. And currently I am attending the University of Madison where I'm pursuing vocal performance uh, as well. I focus on not only operatic performance, but dismantling the pre notions with uh, black music and people of color music performance within classical music schools, as well as in higher ed in the recruiting equity in that field as well. All right, thank you. I think that's such a cool experience. I never even looked at equity from the standpoint of musicianship and creativity. And I think that's a really cool way of looking at that subject. That's so nice. All right, I'm gonna head down here to Mr. Roger Weaver. Can you introduce yourself and tell us about who you are? Yeah, um, so hello, my name is Roger Weaver. Uh, I'm currently serving in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, I have spent the better half of my adult life overseas. So I guess I'm just offering a unique perspective of what it's like to just be black and travel the world and what perspective other people have as far as black Americans go. Awesome, thank you so much for coming. Roger has been a friend of mine for a long time and he is certainly well-traveled. He's been to a lot of places <laughs> and he still owes me a kimono. Um, and we're gonna move right over here. Is, is your name, is it Chris? Yes. Millicent? Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Milleron. I live in Marshall, Missouri. Um, been here for a little over 30 years. I've worked in the Department of Mental Health for just over 30 years. I've been a youth pastor here for 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. I was raised in St. Louis in a very uh, privileged family. Um, just began the journey to understanding my white privilege about 10 years ago. And since then, it's been, you know, a passion of mine, understanding my privilege, understanding, uh, you know, white privilege as a whole, um, understanding what it means to be an ally and an anti-racist. Um, this past summer, uh, following, um, oh, the BLM rallies, which we have one here in Marshall, uh, I'm the founding member of the Marshall Rise organization, which is a grassroots organization designed to uh, build community, break down barriers uh, and prejudices, and just empower others in the community. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and thank you for getting us kind of into that first question. But before we begin, I just want to reintroduce myself. I'm Shamika Piggy, and I'm the VP of Operations here at SUFE, Stand Up for Equity. And I just want to thank you guys again for being here so we can get into this discussion. Uh, so the first question that I had for you guys as panelists is, how would you define privilege? And Chris, you kind of just led us into it. So if you would like to start, that'd be really good. Um, okay. Uh I grew up not knowing I had privilege. Um, you know, I grew up in a 
privileged uh, suburb outside of St. Louis um, with two upper class working parents. Um, looking back, there was a distinctive railroad tracks in, uh, in my suburb in Webster Groves, um, but I was not aware of it. I was very much um, immune or um, sheltered from my own privilege. Uh, I had, I have friends um, who were black and people of color uh, as close friends in high school, but I still didn't get it. Um, and I believe it was about 10 years ago that I was going to a conference and one of the keynote speakers at the conference uh, was an author of Waking Up White. Mm -hmm. And I read the book prior to going to this conference so I'd have a little bit of knowledge and it just, it shook my world. And um, as I like to share mm -hmm. with other people trying to um, come to grips with their privilege, as I continue to do, um, it was devastating. It sent me through every emotion, grief and anger and devastation and just understanding the benefits I had um, throughout my life that I took for granted and was not even aware of. Mm. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in and give their own take on what they believe privilege to be, specifically in talking about institutional racism? Um, I, yeah, go ahead, Deshaun. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, privilege, specifically white privilege, um, has to do with the color of your skin not affecting your ability to choose what you want to do. Um, or have any judgment in whatever you want to do. And I think there's a common misconception of, well, I'm white and I'm not successful, therefore I don't have white privilege. And it's not necessarily a matter of success, it's a matter of having the ability and the freedom and not having the systemic hurdles and obstacles to overcome like those who are of color. Um, and so I think that's a, an important thing to also address is that just because you may be poor um, and white does not mean that you're not inherently um, benefiting from white privilege. Mm -hmm. And um, I think extension, we can also talk about, you know, there are other levels of privilege. You know, I, as a black person, have different privileges, but it's because of the different obstacles that I've had to overcome to experience the level of privilege that I have. But, you know, there is still that systemic racism, those systemic hurdles that overcome every day um, that other people may know. Okay. I like that you kind of talked a lot about, as a Black person, having some privileges as well. Um, but we do this comparison all the time between there's uh, privileges that we kind of look at as this is white privilege and then looking at black people as if almost we are not privileged, but then there's individual privileges within our own communities. Right. I can definitely say there's parts of me as my growing up, I have privilege over other black kids. Um, just growing up in a two parent home, which meant that I had two earners in my home. So of course that removed a load from like one person. So we were able to afford more things and go on more vacations that maybe some kids in my community didn't have access to. And so privilege in a sense when we're talking about institutional racism doesn't mean that we are not acknowledging our own privileges intercommunity wise, but we're looking at it from community versus community. And we can then say that even in the white community, there are privilege within their intercommunity uh, that exists as well. But when we're looking at a standard, there's clearly this divide that separates us from the black community versus the dominant cultures community um, that allows them to gain extreme opportunities and chances in relationship to other people across the border in different races. Right. Okay. Bryn, I know you're going next, so I'll go ahead, take the. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to direction that you both went actually. Um, and 
putting that into a, maybe a larger context in a way that we can talk about privilege, you know, and say white privilege. Um, but I think we also have to, like you both just mentioned, talk about how other systems of power uh, intersect uh, with 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 that, you know, in terms of uh, our, our class system, system for example. Um, and so in terms of gender uh, uh, advantages, uh, you know, like, so I, I guess I have it all uh, in a way as so the white male, um, uh, wealthy-ish, you know, um, and all those are privileges that intersect. Uh, and it's important to bring that, I think, in our minds, uh, particularly if we're talking about white privilege, uh, because that, that's a sensitive topic um, uh, for the, some people who are white who are are poor uh, or low income because uh, they're uh, like they don't feel very privileged, right? Uh, even even then, uh, they probably have advantages that uh, other people don't have. Uh, for example, going to uh, an interview and almost assuredly that person is going to be white who's interviewing them. Um, and that gives them an advantage, an unearned advantage. Um, and so I think it's helpful to think about, you know, the different s systems of inequality or stratification, however you want to talk about it, uh, uh, as we talk about uh, privilege, because there's lot, lots of ways of being privileged. Yeah. Thank you. You kind of brought up something that just takes me back to undergrad in sociology. Um, we, we talked about intersectionality. It's like when we're bridging all these pieces together and how it results in different outcomes from different people across race, across gender, across ability. Um, and that's something that SUFE we've been really talking about recently, these combined struggles that result in someone's ability to attain success versus someone's inability to attain success. So. Thank you. Roger, do you have any take on uh, this question? How would you define privilege? Uh, yeah, actually. So there's, I want to say freedom of expression or personality. Just in, as a personal example, so I get into a lot of really weird hobbies. So I like house decorating and painting and all these weird avenues that not a lot of people, especially from where I come from, are into. And it's always something I hear. It's like, oh, that's like very white of you. It's like, why? What what aspect about my hobbies or my interests is defined as white? Or what how is that not a characteristic of being black? And I could have friends that are possibly white and they dress a certain way or they act a certain way. And that's just normal for them. Hmm. And yet you like me or act like I do don't get the same freedom. And it's just, that to me in itself is a privilege. Yeah. I think that's interesting that you bring that up because it talks about, when we're speaking specifically from our culture, the black culture, we get really grouped as this monolithic <laughs> form of people. It's like, there's a set standard of what a black man and a black woman is. And then the minute you step out of it, it's like, you're not doing your culture right. And someone calls you out and it's like you're not playing your role and it almost becomes like really hard to break and you're like well what is it i think it gives you a sense of this internal issue where you're like well what is wrong with me why am i not black enough or why i'm not you know doing the things that my culture has outlined for me to practice why am i not practicing it appropriately and you do, you do get this call out from other people who may not be engaging in those behaviors or interested in those activities or hobbies and things yeah that's a really interesting concept to bring up. Um, I never look at it like that as freedom of expression to choose what it is that you want to do and not what you're supposed to do. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that people often forget that when you're a black person that does those things that are not black enough, that blackness is brought with you. You know, I've been in music since I was little. I've been in art since I was little. I've had interests that weren't black enough. And when I'm an artist, I'm a black artist. When mm. I'm a classical singer, I'm a black classical singer. Me singing Wagner, me singing Verdi, me singing Puccini, Schumann, I bring in all the black things from my culture and my past experience into the space that just happens to be white. And therefore I qualify it to be black in that moment, being mm. black. You know, there's that, that wider expansion of culture of 
saying black people we have this it's mine and we don't want to say well this is mine but i'm also able to go get something else and to make it mine and i think yeah. that's also a lever that you know roger was mentioning with the privilege and there are people that are dominantly raced i think it's what you said um they have a inherent ability to say what I want, I can go do. I don't have to worry about being qualified um, in the sense of, am I good enough for it? Am I going to be judged? And so I think it's just this cultural expansion of Black people, of Blackness that is so encompassing that I think as a people, we have to move past as well. Mm. I, I see that too. I think that it's crazy that you bring up like musicianship because even though I gave up music a long time ago, I tried the saxophone some years ago, it didn't work for me. Um, it don't work for anybody. <laughs> alto sax wasn't my friend. Um, hey, uh, but I definitely found my love in theater, and I've done theater for over to 13, 14 years now since I was like 14. Um, and I remember playing Lady M from the Scottish play that we can't really say the real name of. Um, but I remember thinking in moments because she does have so much aggression, like how much of this am I reinforcing as a black woman, this you know systemic thing of the angry black woman when I play this role and how does it recreate Lady M in this way to be looked at as like even worse than she is in the actual reading of that play. So it's, you know, you bring with it your experiences to, you know, creativity. And because what people believe that they know black people to be, it gets colored in that way. So it was like in the privilege in that sense is with, you know, someone, you know, who was white playing Lady M, you know, she's just still Lady M. It didn't change anything. Her dynamic coming to that role didn't change it. So I look at that as well as like we have these opportunities uh, for us that are, are more lacking. And we see with white America, they can be anything they want to be, where we have to be, you know, the things that people want to box us into. Yeah. A colleague in the church um, asked me a question several years ago. And we were at some church events, so everybody was talking about their blessings, and God blessed me with this, and I've been blessed with this. And he asked me, he said, are those really blessings? Or are those privileges? Mm. And that just shook me, because not only, okay, I'm white, I'm straight, um, I got a college degree without any debt, I have health insurance, I have no disabilities, um, oh, I like your life. I'm, I'm a Christian, <laughs> and so I really got to examining all those. And now, every time I want to say, "Oh, well, I'm so blessed," you know, mm. um, it, it, is it really a blessing, or is it just my my privilege that I keep forgetting? And mm -hmm. that's kind of what I think of privilege. You know, my office is on the first floor. It's all single level. So if I had a disability, I wouldn't have that privilege. Or, you know, it's it's a part of my everyday life. Yeah. Um, I don't have to worry about going to the doctor if I have an illness because I have health insurance and it's not going to make me bankrupt. Um, you know, so many things that just it's ingrained that I forget, but mm -hmm. it's really made me very conscious of not saying I'm blessed, but saying I'm privileged to have this. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fine line that we that we walk as believers because I, I say I'm blessed about a lot of things too. And I don't know, I don't know, it's hard to say, you know, you know, when you said, <laughs> really resonate when he's like, I have no college yet. I said, mm, you know, praise Jesus, <laughs> you know, immediately. Thank the yeah. Lord, <laughs> you know, because college debt is horrible. But then you think it's like, you know, is this the blessings that I get for being righteous and for being devout? Or, you know, did you just happenstancely walk upon this, you know, this unearned thing that we've come to know, you know, privileged to be? And that's really yeah. hard because you want to be thankful. You want to be, you know, constantly you know, praise God for this. He, he did so much for me. Um, and in, in saying that, you could also 
in a lot of ways I struggle with this is like thanking God for th these things that I have. And it's like, well, if I'm thanking God for these things and if someone else doesn't have it, does that mean that they have less favor with God? And that's where it becomes this question mm -hmm. of who, who give it and who doesn't, you know, who take it away. Mm -hmm. So that's a hard thing with, you know, especially in Christianity to talk about. Yeah. All right. I want to move us to the next set of questions in uh, the presentation. We talk a lot about cultural practices that we see that are sustained in our communities by mechanisms of institutional racism. Um, and in this, we kind of, I broke down cultural practice becomes a result of reinforcing poor behavior, um, these negative associations that are made with people of color um, that then become reinforced. And then failure to engage these practices can then result in punishment and to the person who was supposed to be implementing these things, these authority figures. We talked a lot about controlling agencies through government and law and how these cultural practices can become laws, even though um, they're not so great and they don't really work to the benefit of people of color. Um, so the question is like, what are some cultural practices that you guys see sustained through institutional racism, through these mechanisms that are perpetual and that kind of take on a life of their own? I think art, um, you know, I mean, uh, going off of Christianity at that moment, uh, you know, I didn't know that Jesus Christ was brown until I was in college. Mm, um, yes. In my field, people often think that every person that's not poor and best is white. I didn't realize, you know, I did an opera in undergrad and we had to do research on the opera and I didn't realize that part of the opera takes place in Egypt, but the person that was doing the role was white, but we didn't talk about these things. Mm. And so I think this suspended disbelief in music, I'll say, and, and in some facets of art that white is the norm, is the mm -hmm. standard, and anything from that is a DV, no matter if it's, um, I'm going to use a, a scare quote, authentic, if it's more authentic. Um, so. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely understand that. Just because we get so used to being paired with, you know, criminality and deviancy, it's hard for us and even media to move past those, even roles that people accept. I, and, and then we get praise for those roles as well. I always think about Denzel Washington and, uh, what is it? The movie where he plays this crooked cop. Training uh, day. Training day. Yeah. And he plays this crooked cop and he gets the Academy Award for it. But before that, he was playing Malcolm X. He was nominated for the Academy Award, but then he was denied. It's It was like he was so reinforcing for him to be this criminal because it played into the patterns that are already in existence that are perpetual. Um, you know, that black people are criminals. And for, for a lot of white audiences, it just reinforced that belief again. And it almost was like, well, yeah, that was more realistic take on him as a, you know, as, you know, as a, you know, dirty cop that would make more sense for, you know, that role. That's more realistic than him playing Malcolm X. So you think about these cultural practices that are currently at play and we just kind of reinforce them again and again. I see it in journalism. And I won't say this in my own community necessarily. Um, it's a real small community, but watching the news, um, you know, if there's a suspect who happens to be black, why the photograph is going to be of a mugshot. And it's going to be, you know, this is what he's been accused of. This is what he's done in the past, yada, yada, yada. And um, if it's a white suspect, why it's going to be their senior photo or their mm. college photo or them in a suit. And they were such a good student and they played these sports and those sports. And I just see it all the time. Yeah, definitely a different telling of criminality in that, that sense. I, I remember this case, the recent case that was going on with the white man that killed pretty much every member of his family, he killed his wife, he killed his two daughters. That was, you know, he was so prominent. And they showed during the discussion of his him, him murdering his entire family, they showed a picture of him and his family happy. 
And it was the most disturbing thing to me because it just was like, oh, wow, that's uh, that was really deranged. It's like, is this like we get used to pairing, you know, these positive associations with people who are, who are not of color. Um, and then we get so used to pairing these poor associations, these poor, you know, um, markers with people who are of color. And even when the, and it, the, it continues to happen, even when it doesn't make sense. Um, and just in that specific case, I, it, I was disturbed by the fact that they used a family photo of him and his wife and his kids, and then saying in the same respect, he murdered his entire family. And they looked so happy. It was just like, oh God, that's the worst image ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think and to uh, to parallel that, you know, in my photos and pretty much all my photos, I smiled and won. Um, you know, I'm a six foot five. 300 pound black man, my dreadlocks are very long. Um, so I'm in here. And so, you know, if something were to happen and I was to be accused, I want them to have to search for a picture that is not smiling, it, which is a, mm -hmm. you know, that criminal idea of, and those things that are in place we have to fight against, you know, that itself, the fact that I have to think about well, what if something like this happens to me? What if I'm the next hashtag? I want pictures of me smiling, pictures of me happy for people to see and not something of me scowling or looking scary. And so I think that's another you know, parallel to that. Yeah, I think Even that's- You have to be conscious of that. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. I never think about like, that, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, people always say you have a beautiful smile. Why your smile so beautiful? And I'm like, thank you for practicing. There were many. <laughs> I did, you know, for for you know years in the mirror. I would look in the mirror and smile, and make make sure that I could smile on the drop of a dime. Mm. So that I, you know, I often with a cheerier disposition because again, I'm this imposing figure, and I don't want people to be afraid of me. I went on the bus today, and a gentleman clutched a bag when I walked by and I'm listening to music from Paul's Drag Race in my headphones. But because of the way I look, it was it was fearful to him. Mm. I think for, and I can't ever speak on this because I'm not a black man, but do you feel like that Roger as well? Like as a black man, you have to make yourself almost look smaller, less scary, less intimidating. Um. Yeah, I mean, to a degree. And it's, so I have like two registers of voice that I use. The one that I'm using now, just because it's a higher pitch, less baritone, less bass. Um, and I practiced it in high school to where it's almost natural until there's a point where I'm fed up with the world. Um, and then I'm just done. Like I, I use my natural register. And at that point, it's very much like, I am bigger than life, hear me move. And I think it's, I don't know where it came from. I'm not entirely sure because I've never felt like I had to pretend to be a different person. I think it's just, I just developed it and I'm not really sure why. I never really dug too deep into it, but there are definitely moments where it's, there's, I'm, I'm just like, I don't feel like I need to, to be a gentle, pleasant, caring person. I can just be a person who is irritated today because life is frustrating or I've had a bad day at work or I'm just not feeling dealing with people. And it's at those moments where I have to make a conscious decision to switch out of a, a pleasant personality for everyone to deal with and just be very, very realistic. Like, look, man, like I'm human. I'm human. First and foremost, before anything else. So regardless of whether or not this terrifies you or you are scared because you thought that I should have been a happy person, like I'm, I'm going through things as well. And then I have to make a conscientious flip to just be realistic with people. Hmm. I think that's interesting take on it to have to make a decision to be yourself because I think I've dealt with that a lot recently. I think leveling up and becoming this professional now that I have to be with clients and at the agency that I am at, it changed um, a lot about me professionally. And, you know, at my older job, um, I will definitely be more myself because I've been there for six years and 
I would just be like, you know, if I didn't like something, everybody knew it, you know. <laughs> I let it be very much known and, and be very vocal because I had six years of history there being all the different things. But moving to this new job, I had only been, I don't, I've only been there a year now. And half of that, over half of that year has been at home. Um, and so like that cold switching that you're kind of talking about has been really beneficial. Um, and even sometimes that doesn't work. I had a recently just to talk about this issue because you just reminded me of it, where one of my providers, I couldn't see him in person, older guy, um, she, oh, he uh, was, he heard my voice on the phone and he knew my name. Um, and so he was very like questioning me and it got back to my you know supervisor. Like he didn't trust that I was the person that I said I was or I had the credentials that I said I had and that I was who I was. And so he called my supervisor who is a white woman and he's like, I just don't trust who is this person. Can you validate her? And she was just like, yeah, she's my supervisee. She's handling the case. It's not mine. Uh, you got to call her and, and get the specs on. I can't help you. Um, and he was, you know, like, well, you should be able to tell me the, the things. And she's like, go back to her. She's the one over the case. Um, and so he had to come back to me. But me, her, me and her had a real big discussion about like race in the workplace and what it looks like. And she's like, it's hard to combat all of that right now. And we could talk about it. But, you know, her big solution was in your email where you can kind of put your you know credentials and things um put your title put your degree put everything on your name so that it validates you and then when you're on zoom put your degrees behind you so like i don't know if you can see this but these are my degrees that i have to post just to be validated when i'm in front of my clients so i have my state licensure my master's degree, and then even a certificate that says that I know I don't only pass my master's degree program, but I pass it with a 4.0, just to validate me. So that was my solution to a problem. So yeah, yeah. So um, moving. Oh, go ahead. You got something to say? <laughs> I was just thinking, because uh, you mentioned what what type of practices are in place that maintains systemic racism. And one that I always think about, because in the military, physical fitness is a huge part of what we do. Uh, and it's that coupled with education, I guess. But as far as the physical aspect goes, it's I'm a young black male, I should be able to do X, Y, and Z, like run fast and max out all the things that we do physically. And I'm like, look, man, I was not the best runner going through high school. I was like, I don't run. So running is hard for me. And then I was like, oh, wow, but you're black. And I'm like, your point? And then I always have to bring up, like, I can swim because I used to go to the pools when I was a kid. And then as soon as I left America, I started going in oceans. And I'm like, oh, I didn't think black people could swim. And it's like, what? Like, all the tests that we have, all the assumptions, if it is, it doesn't matter. It's like, it's always, oh, well, you'll be in the group with either the fast runners or the people who can't swim. And I'm like, why? Like, what, what dictates that? And I'm like, oh, we just assume that. And I'm like, what do you, and it's difficult because I always have to combat this and deal with this and explain it. Like, yes, I can be black and have grown up near a pool. Like I can know how to swim or I could have been black and not run fast because I wasn't, you know, drafted into football or I wasn't automatically playing sports from age six. Like that's not how it works to be black. And I think there's a disproportionate amount of people that are expecting black kids to be sports athletes as opposed to academics or artists or just any other vocation. Mm -hmm. I always think about that like a lot. I mean, I, I can agree to that. I definitely, you know, a lot of us went to Central. Um, I was not a sports kid. I was a theater geek, true and true. <laughs> and just an academic kid. Like, I'm here on scholarships because I don't do any of that stuff down there. You don't want me on your team. You don't want none of it. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about traditional formulations of criminal as it concerns mass incarceration. I talked about it 
in the presentation that there is this belief that well, this isn't a systemic issue. There's just groups of people or people in, who are individuals who are these criminals. And unfortunately, they're coming off from this, this one race. Like, what do you guys think about traditional formulations of criminal and their effect on mass incarceration, um, if you feel like there's one at all? If I can go first. Yeah, anybody can jump in. Sweet. I was uh, actually having this conversation with my wife and a couple other people. I think it definitely started as a systemic racial issue. It, it was all Black people, all minorities. Um, everyone was sequestered to be like, oh, you are automatically criminals because if you're not white, then you're not right. Um, mm -hmm. And as the progression of American society and American culture came about, and as you started getting more rights for Black people, I think that they started pushing it into an economic issue. And so you have social economic inequalities where you have families who started off probably as slave traders or um, plantation owners who have been able to invest in their families through generations and leave their families money. They grow up and they become very, very powerful in society. And you have a lot of other families who didn't get that opportunity. And so as you fast forward to the 21st century, you now have groups of Black people living in um, really bad neighborhoods. Or, mm -hmm. And they're not bad because there's nothing there. They're just bad because the city itself will not invest in them through just decades of neglect and abuse. So like redlining was a thing. Um, you sequestered all these individuals into very bad housing areas. You put liquor stores next to churches. You put no after school activities. You didn't build parks and playgrounds. You built maybe a basketball court and nothing. So these kids have nothing and nowhere to go. And then as that progresses, the system doesn't care. Like it doesn't care the fact that these these groups of people, which are predominantly black or uh, in like California, predominantly Latino or Latina, um, and they don't have anything to grow. They don't have anything to benefit from, but you have other communities that are predominantly white that have playgrounds and libraries and community centers and all these things that they can go do and be in and they don't even realize that it is a product of the system. Like it, it was designed that way so that you would all have opportunity and then everyone else who lives in these really bad areas that they never invested in would have nothing to look forward to. They would have worse education. They would have terrible schools. They would have uh, more violence, gun stores, drug stores, all these things that were easily accessible and available to them and then you criminalize them for it. Ooh, you just like went into a whole entire history lesson of Absolutely. what it means to have systematic racism in our country and how it's built. Because we can all agree, like, yes, yeah, slavery didn't end, you know, in 1865. It definitely just transitioned from one system to another, one form of an institution into another. Um, and it's been perpetuated. We think right now about the, the prison issue. Prison reform is such a hot topic right now. And we're trying our best to get rid of this problem, but then we're looking at it and everyone can take a piece of the prison system and try to work on it. And then just realize there's 20, 30 more branches of problems still underneath that because it's so embedded and it's been built on. And not only now do we have prison labor that's a form of slavery, but it's like we have industries that are in the prison system making a profit. So now how do you get these people out of here? Uh, so it's just so many problems when we're talking about, you know, systemic racism. It's just, it's, all, it's so many different legs that we can pull from and we, we would not be done pulling for a long time just to kind of uncover the mess that it comes with. Yeah. And the educational system is so messed up, um, you know, in the school to prison pipeline. Um, you've got these um, low income school districts that can't get teachers there. When the teachers are there, um, you know, they they're, don't have the materials, don't have the income, don't have the resources to buy the, um, you know, educational uh, materials, uh, the testing. And then, 
the the referrals to the juvenile system you know um Mm. a kid gets into one fight and they've got a juvenile officer you know and because there's no resources to to help them whereas these kids in these uh affluent school districts you know they get a pat on the back or a slap on the hand so yeah I think the school to prison pipeline has got to. It's out of control. (laughs) (laughs) I um, definitely was, and I hate saying it now, but it was the truth and I had, I own it because I was a part of the problem. Um, I used to work at a adolescent rehab. I was a counselor um, and I was a part of the school to prison pipeline system. I supported it. It was my job. I did it for six years. And it wasn't until I was too deep in that I realized that I was perpetuating a system of inequality. Um, like you say, there's these kids, they get these DJOs, they, these juvenile officers. I work closely with a juvenile officer. I would give all this information on the progress of this kid to this DJO. And I would support them getting recriminalized back into the system because that was your job. Your job is to try to engage rehabilitation and to you know cure this substance abuse addiction and you know and if it didn't work you gave these bad reports that only resulted in further punishment for this kid and moving them further and further from school they would be in our rehab for, you know facility for 2 months you know missing school for 2 straight months so it's it was just it kind of perpetuated the system and it wasn't until i was sitting in it and listening to the meetings my staffing meetings and seeing a lot of my African-American clients get thrown into the garbage, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And and I was just like, I got to get out of here. This is, this is not really what I want. This is not who I am at all. Uh, Because the system makes you believe you're doing the right thing. It makes you believe you're doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, I can build on a little bit of what Roger was saying and talking about um, Ferguson, for example. Um, We're talking about traditional uh, formulations of criminal, um, uh, uh, people of criminal in Ferguson, Missouri, of course, we had a city uh, that was using its citizens as an ATM. Um, Essentially, uh, with two thirds of the people uh, living in Ferguson, predominantly black uh, 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 city, uh, two thirds of the people were uh, had a warrant for their arrest, uh, mm. and their th- this entire system uh, from policing, uh, from the chief of police uh, to the city council, were all in on it, um, and so they had this mm-hmm. system that was uh, penalizing, heavily penalizing people for minor infractions. Um, And then when they uh, didn't show up for their court appearance uh, because they, uh, um, you know, didn't want to, you know, lose their job or something like that, uh, then they'd get penalized even more. uh, So they city so much. Um, And so they had, the the city had their citizens under their thumb. and, and partly they were able to do that because they saw them as them, you know, those people as predominantly white police force, predominantly white city council, um, and saw them as, you know, the problem and them as the majority of citizens uh, in the city. Mm. I think that is, that's crazy. When I always think about St. Louis as, when we talk about the, the issues of a, you know, urban core, St. Louis has so many, you know, issues that are just compounding for like years of systematic injustice. And looking at that, just how, you know, they were, it was like a a feeding system just to kind of promote, you know, people's income, just to feed these people into the system and increase, you know, incarceration rates, um, which again is a whole nother feeding of the system. So when we go from these traditional formulations it's easier because when we we're talking about it in the presentation, it's easier to put it on the individual instead of looking at a flawed system. It's, you know, we can put it and say these people are dangerous, they're criminals, and we need to really be heavy on crime because of this issue. But they never once look at what perpetuated these problems, um, what creates this system of criminality, how many resources are in these communities, what do you leave people left with? 
to compete for, which is ultimately nothing. And so you create criminals and you create a way to feed your system. It's really interesting. Thank you, Dr. Meyer, for that. That was thank you for bringing us back to because you know we can go on some tangents. <laughs> um, I talked a lot about the fear that solicited and evoked from these associations. So we were commonly are pairing people with deviancy and criminality. I say that they become a conditioned aversive stimulus. And it's kind of what we call it in behaviorism. I can condition you to be scared of something pretty easily just by pairing it consistently over time with something that you're already afraid of, something that you already you know, hate or you don't like or is just distasteful to you. So my question is, when we appear people with these stimuli for so long that they, they now take on the fear itself just by seeing them, is this fear that we've conditioned and elicited, is it real? Is the fear real that we have of minority people and minority communities based on what our thoughts are in regards to their criminality and its perceived deviancy? Is it real? I think the short answer is, I think yes and no. I think yes, it's real for the system to continue to thrive and function to put down those people that it negatively affects. In the same regard, I think no, it's not because that's whenever you know we as a people actually come together. That's whenever things get fixed. That's when systems get dismantled. <laughs> Thank you. So I think it's it's both yes and no. I mean, it's the system that we have tells us yes because it's afraid for us. It's afraid if we ever find out that it's no. Okay, I see you're, it's more like you're saying we have this notion of fear. Um, I always look at the fear as irrational. Like, yeah, you may fear something, but is that fear really a real fear? Um, and is it, or is it, you know, is it ra irrational? Is it just like something that we've heightened up to continue to en en engage the system and to feed it, you know, people? I may be way off base here, and I hope y'all tell me out if I am, but I think uh, white supremacy um, perpetuates that fear and, and feeds that fear and wants us to fear. Uh, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, you hear all these people saying, well, what about the riots? And what about the burnings? And what about this? And what about the property destruction and the looting? Well, that was white groups coming in to perpetuate that fear, whereas you see the actual Black Lives Matter movement peacefully protesting. Mm -hmm. So I think there are groups of people who are feeding that fear, trying to keep it alive. Keep the momentum going. Yeah. Yes. Anyone else have thoughts on this? Yeah, I'd just like to add on just one thing. I think Chris, you're uh, right on. Uh, and what's feed, we have an entire news channel, the most popular news channel in the United States that feeds that fear. Yes. Uh, and that 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 plays the violence of, of uh, or supposed violence of Black Black Lives Matter over and over and over every single night, um, and that generates real fear uh, because we live in segregated neighborhoods, right? We uh, yeah. people uh, and so we're not around people, right? Uh, uh, so the people who are watching Fox News aren't in those neighborhoods, right? Um, and they're just seeing that as a distant thing that's happening, and it's scary, and it's scary to them. And so I think it's it's quite real. You kind of brought up something that just again takes me back to school. We talked about the um, the contact hypothesis. You know, it was like the more you're around people of color the, or anybody, the less in, of the the less unfamiliar they seem. So it's like you increase familiarity when you're you're around them, you know them, you know actual people of color, you know actual black people. Um, and they you know, it you know, it kind of almost unarms that fear in a way because you have something to combat it up against. So I think that's it really goes back to supporting what's in the literature and what's evidence-based. 
Anybody else want to talk about that fear stimulus? Yeah, kind of. I think that it is um, passed on. Or, man, all, okay, so bear with me. There's a, I was taking a class in the military, and they have what they call the red monkey theory. I know it has a probably a more scientific name, but uh, they have four or five monkeys in a cage, and they have a thing of bananas at the top. And you have a monkey that sees the bananas wants to go get it. But every time a monkey tries to go up, they spray the rest of them with cold water. Um, and they continue this until the monkeys all realize that going up the cage equals something bad. And then they slowly replace the monkeys. And then the new monkey wants to go up. Um, and then all the monkeys stop them and they attack this monkey. And they're like, the monkey doesn't know why, has no idea about the cold water. And slowly, one by one, they replace each monkey until now they all attack the newest monkey that tries to go up but they have never been sprayed with cold water. And I think the fear is about as real as that equivalency. Like no one knows why they're afraid, they're just afraid. And maybe at some point it was real. There was a very real fear of the consequences that you could experience. And that as we progress, that fear has now been inherited. And a majority of people have no idea why they're afraid. They are mm -hmm. just afraid because they've been told to be afraid and they've been educated that there is something bad that happens. And I think about like the, um, the Black Panthers were instantly labeled as a criminal extremist organization, despite the fact that the only reason that they were ever created was to protect their own communities, mm -hmm. a very militant organized group. And yet other militant groups of that era were never considered extremists, not until like another decade or so later. And that and it's it's that concept there. It's like they were told to be afraid and they have no idea why they should have been afraid. And so eventually the fear that they were supposed to experience is gone. That stimuli is gone. But everyone else after them has now inherited that fear and they just experienced that. So I don't know if it's actually real if they should actually be afraid in that sense. But I think it's very much real that they have an idea, a very antiquated idea that is just being kept alive. Mm, yeah. I mean, once something is conditioned, it's hard to break unless there's an active getting in there, breaking it up. You're doing something very targeted to do it. And I think that kind of just reinforces it again. We've been talking a lot about institutional racism specifically. I know we've been looking at the criminal system, the justice system. Um, I know we there's been this thing and um, we've been hearing it a lot where it's like not every cop is bad, right? There's like, the, there's no such thing as, you know, there's some good cops, right? We hear it a lot. Um, so the question I have for you guys is in a flawed institution a systematic injustice, is there individual accountability? What are your thoughts? Well, that was a, I, I, when I saw the question. I thought it was a little bit uh, strange, but how you how you how you set it up, I think, is uh, an interesting way. Uh, so, talking about are there good cops? Obviously, there are. Um, uh, there is also good cops following uh, unjust systems and laws that shouldn't uh, be in place. Uh, and practices that shouldn't be in place, uh, and habits of policing that shouldn't be in place, um, and so uh, there needs certainly there can be individual responsibility uh, within that framework. Um, but the the issue is that we are constantly producing police officers that are um, uh, engaging in police brutality, um, uh, engaging in. Um, uh, unjust uh, policing practices, um, uh, like uh, I don't want to talk about Ferguson again, but uh, like what we saw in Ferguson. Uh, and so we had a federal review of the unjust, unconstitutional practices the police force was engaging in. Um, and so in, in some ways, there was uh, individual accountability in that case. Um, you saw that the, the chief of police uh, uh, left. Um, uh, many police officers left, city council uh, people were uh, replaced, um, and it looks a lot different now uh, than it did before. 
Um, and so, you know, maybe there's a good story there. I, I, I don't know. I haven't seen data on that yet. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but there's certainly um, the accountability there. Uh, but we also have to be very diligent in pointing out the injustices, you know, in terms of policing and not dismiss it by saying there's a couple bad apples. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of where my question was leading is, you know, can we look towards individual accountabil accountability when we know we're looking at an institutional problem? Um, and can we, you know, specifically looking at the Ferguson case, because that's the one we're kind of analyzing right now, is that we were able to say yeah, these individuals did some really bad things. Um, it kind of, it, even though that's in really good efforts to kind of restructure the entire system in a way, but when we put this individuals did very bad things, it's almost so easily to dismiss this as an individual problem. And that becomes an issue when you're continually pushing out people like this again and again, and then they mess up a next time. Oh, well, these individuals did some really bad things. It keeps the you know, system from being, it goes, it, it allows the system to go unchallenged because we can always throw that accountability on. These are some horrible cops. Um, and then we just continue to produce more horrible cops because we didn't do anything to change the conditioning, the teaching that's going into making them who they are. I've never been in the criminal justice system. Um, but I was thinking individual accountability from the opposite spectrum as far as being an ally and being an anti-racist and calling out the system in the criminal justice system, criminal justice system that are the problem. And, you know, I think like a lot of systems, um, you know, that have had these horrible um practices for so long and then an anti-racist or an ally comes in there and tries to call them all out um i see that person being you know being the individual accountability but mm -hmm. um, i'm thinking it would almost have to be a mob mentality to call out the injustices because otherwise that one person is just going to get shunned and booted out of the system so yeah. I kind of took your question from the exact opposite standpoint, not individual accountability from the person perpetuating, but from people trying to make a change. Yeah, there's no right or wrong way to look at it. I think we look at it from our perspectives. You know, I would definitely see this as a question where, you know, you know, in this case, do white allies have a responsibility to educate their friends, their families, uh, their church members, the people that they're connected to about what it means to be anti-racist um, and what it means to engage anti-racist, you know, content. Because uh, it's all about everything that we're doing all the time that feeds us and it continues to shape us in our thoughts. But yeah, you can definitely take it from that perspective. Um, I just hear a lot in this discussion on individual accountability you know, what is it, you know, in, in a lot of these cases, like, well, these these people here, um, these individuals have a problem and they, that problem needs to be fixed. Um, and it's just like that kind of talk just continues to save systems of inequality. Um, and then we don't want to perpetuate that, but then we have no other way to keep it from continuing because no one's talking about how do we change the system. It's more about how we change these people. Yeah. So I'm an alarm going off. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's time to do some stuff. Uh, anyone else have any thoughts before we get to our last question of the night? Sorry. Right. Do you have any more thoughts on this uh, question before we get to the last one, Roger? Um. Yes. <clears throat> trying to get individual accountability is great. I just don't know how effective that's going to be if you're getting accountability from the bottom of the system. So people who write the policies and create these systems, <laughs> accountability needs to be there as far as individual accountability goes. Otherwise, it's, it's just too little to affect the system as a whole. Like police officers that are usually getting in trouble are not, you know, like, superintendents they're not they're not head of the police force it's once things get bad enough then they remove that person 
and it just instills someone else who maintains the system. Like going after the guys who are just out there on the streets doing the job, I think it becomes very much that it's just a job for them. Like at some point they care, but it's really just a job. They do this as much as anyone who goes to the grocery store checks out groceries. And mm. they don't they don't control the system. They are just a part of it. Yeah, I think that what we're talking about is like there's a hierarchical need for change um, going from the top down. And I can say that about a lot of institutions, honestly, from when I was working in, you know, rehab in the mental health field. Right. Because that's where we were. Um, and I will see that there was a need for hierarchical change from the CEO child all the way down to the janitors working in the building. <laughs> I was like, we need like a whole systematic restructuring of what it is that we're doing here, especially after realizing that, you know, I was an agent perpetuating an, an you know, unjust system. So definitely looking at that. All right, final question of the night, you guys. Just again, want to thank you guys for being here. Um, what are some suggestions you have for how we can dismantle institutional racism? And I know that's loaded, but throw what you can out there. <laughs> okay. I think, um, you know, beginning, bouncing off of what Roger was saying is um, getting people in the system that actually want to affect change. You know, if we want to see change in education, we have to see people that come from places that aren't white. You know, if we want to see a move in the higher ed to have more inclusion, have more equity, we need to have people in the top, like you were saying also, um, to affect those things. We need to have people, you know, writing policies, uh, enforcing policy, uh, policies, um, excuse me. And, you know, that starts at the school district level. You know, if your school district is majority black, why isn't the super black? Well, because of, you know, 13 steps before that. And, you know, I think we have to address those 13 steps. You know, the reason the superintendent is white is because he was able to get an education. Um, he was able to get the experience and access to school and then come to this school. And so I think, you know, if we want to attack those things, it's getting, you know, people of color, people who are of lower incomes, opportunities to, for lack of better words, infiltrate and disrupt the system. That's one of the ways we can affect change. You know, myself, I'll use an example. You know, I chose a predominantly white institution because I knew that I could affect change because I'm the only black person. Oh, well, I'm mm. one of two. They have to. Uh, I want to do something that has to do with equity, inclusion, black music. I'm they talk to. And it's, it's a lot of work on me. Yeah, sure. They can do research and they have to do research. But you know, the first, you know, if I go, then that makes ways for three more people to come behind me, and then three more after those three more. And so I think it's just this domino effect. But it has to start with, you know, people getting out of those jobs. Um, but also, you know, policies being written, uh, funds being allocated for those type of things, for programs to say, if you want to do this thing, uh, going back to our original, uh, question, you know, allowing the freedom of expression, the opportunity, but a lot of that is because right? that's the system that we live in. And so, you know, I think there are so many cogs to fix this, um, but that's my take on it. Thank you so much. Anyone else? I'll go. I'll go. I like this. I like this question. Uh, I feel like dismantle, first and foremost, is a, a very delicate term. And I don't think dismantle should be what we achieve. It's like step-by-step -step removal after it's already been established. Uh, I'm all for destroy, overturn, <laughs> cast aside, because it's a, we can like, burn it to the ground for all our kids. Yeah, just, just burn it. Like, it's just no point of saving it. I mean, it's a system that's flawed. We accept that. That's cool. It's like, but if you're trying to work within the system to affect the system to bring about change, you are just perpetuating the system. You're not, you're not getting anywhere. Create something new. Get rid of it. Destroy it. Hold people accountable. I think the, the most effective way is to just, um, you, you challenge everybody. Uh, like Deshaun was saying, who has the ability to write policies, 
Um, I get into conversations, especially about this last presidency going into the election and into this new era that we're experiencing from um, from a from a global perspective, America is a volatile, untrustworthy country. Because we cannot maintain consistency. We cannot maintain uh, communication within our own walls. And then we're supposed to take that and be the super powerhouse nation and do that everywhere. Nah, like it's it's just it's not feasible. You don't go to somebody who is consistently known for destroying cars and then ask them to bring your car around from the other side of the street like that's <laughs> it's reckless yeah. so you it's still an entirely new system you challenge everybody who has the ability to write anything and then you just destroy it these systems have value because people believe they have value there is inherently no difference from the people who write policies from the people who educate your children <clears throat> there isn't it's simply you think that this person is qualified and thus mm. they are but if you don't believe in the fact that they're qualified, then they aren't qualified. They, they're they're some subject to your in mass belief in their ability to do anything. And so I don't, yeah, just just destroy it, man. Just get rid of the whole system. Like if you don't think the school should be ran this way, then in mass, just get a group of people to agree with you and then do something different. Create new education systems. It's nothing that says you can't teach mass groups of children whatever it is you want to teach and teach them there's nothing that says you can't educate mass groups of people about something different uh because there's, there's nothing that says you can't do anything besides our mass belief in it and i think that if we're truly going to affect change you have to get the the wider group of the population on board and then you build a new system and i think that's the best way to go about it Otherwise, it's like, how can I now take control of the system? And that becomes the ultimate goal. When you started out with how can I, how can I create something new that is beneficial for everyone, as opposed to, you know, this system that is set up to be beneficial to a few. Hmm. It just seems like we're talking about what a lot of people, I guess, in social justice work is talking about this radical change, right? This something that is completely new and different um, that maybe 50, 60 years from now, they'll go like, oh, that wasn't that big of a deal. But right now it's radical. It's crazy. Um, and it's, you know, almost like upsetting for people to hear. <laughs> and we talk about burn down the system and someone's clutching their pearls like, oh, not the system. <laughs> well, because for years, I mean, the system I mean, has been It's radical. I just... I find it hard to affect change when your your limitations are already predetermined by something you want to get rid of. Mm. Oh, talk about mm. it. Talk about it. We we it's so hard for us to restructure even the idea in this country of capitalism because we still think like capitalists when we're trying to restructure it. And it's like, oh, but that can't work. But it's like stop thinking like a capitalist, look at something else and think in a different framework. It's like we're so stuck sometimes. I think people of privilege and, you know, white people, okay, um, need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm. Because right now they're such in this comfort zone and talking about racism and talking about systemic issues is uncomfortable and it's not pretty. But they're not willing to be uncomfortable. Um, this summer, I got my hands on um, police stops statistics for my community, and I addressed the city council. Um, you know, our black population is 5%, but the number of police stops were 12% for blacks. and. I highlighted all this and gave it to the city council and the police chief was there and he was blubbering all over himself trying to defend it and saying, well, that's not accurate. And I said, turned around and I said, you're the one who submitted it to the state. This is your report. <laughs> and, <laughs> you wrote it. No. and I wasn't trying to be accusatory, but I'm like, quit making excuses and let's talk about the problem. You know, I'm not here to call anybody out because it's too late. What's done is done. But how are we going to fix this problem for the next year? Um, but that wasn't even 
on the table that wasn't even on the cards. It was, you know, just deniability and deniability. And, you know, as the person of privilege, I think it's, you know, I take the responsibility um, for calling out injustice when I see it. Um, and it's it's kind of a fine line because, you know, it's it's not, it is my problem and I don't want to be someone else's voice, but yet in certain circumstances, it's the only voice people will listen to. Mm, and yes. I think we as people of privilege need to understand that position that we're in. Um which is a it's a really tricky situation and yeah. I feel uncomfortable talking about it but you know but uh, even in this situation yeah you just said like you gotta dis, you gotta dismantle your comfort exactly and, and stand on your ground I'm talking about it with with people of color but I understand you know the reading how to be an anti-racist you know I have to wake up every day planning on being uncomfortable mm -hmm. and planning on calling out my boss or the mayor or the city council or whoever it is in order to make change happen. Yeah. I talk a lot about white allyship a lot because I think it's, it's, it's extremely important to have because it's, you know, black people talking about this is affecting us. This is affecting us. It doesn't reach into buildings where a lot of white privileged people exist. It's almost like we have to befriend some white people of privilege get them to talk and then like, go tell your friends that it's a problem for us because, you know, white allyship can take us places and spaces that we just don't belong in, that we're not accepted in. So um, it's not, it's not something we can do alone. And I look at the previous work that, you know, has gotten us so far today, even with like the formulation of the NAACP, that was a formulation between white and black people alike. You know, so that community was created because of a shared space and identity and realizing that this is not a singular walk. We do need allies. We do need people to support the cause. And the best work we can do is educate on why this is occurring to help educate white people about why this is occurring so they can go educate their friends and their families and their communities about what's happening and then bring our voice into these spaces where it just, does, it just doesn't exist. Yeah. This past summer, I was asked to speak at the Black Rally, um, sorry, Black Lives Matter rally here in Marshall. And I said, no, that's not my place. You know, that's not my voice that needs to be heard. It's not my place. And then two days later, you know, after thinking about it, I'm like, okay, maybe it is my voice that needs to be heard, you know, for these white people who are here, uh, you know, and that's what I kind of did is just called out you know, white people and our privilege and saying, you know, we've got to, we've got to listen to hear and not just listen to respond. Mm -hmm. You know, I think also something that you were mentioning, Chris, is that we have to wake up every day and actively think about dismantling, working for change. Mm -hmm. We forget or you know, we get tired because something else happens and then we focus on that and something else happens. And so we're constantly being overturned idea, forgetting the central idea of change. And, you know, I, I've been wondering and questioning the, not in a bad way, but the radical change. And I think one of the reasons some people find it is because there's not a, a format for something that's never been done and so you know so everyone's looking for someone to come up with a magical solution of this is how we're going to radically change the system that we don't want to operate in, in anymore and i think i just think it, 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 it we can be inspired by the FA and you know thinking how can we, like we were saying roger collectively change every single day of every single hour and not just black people, but white people and all those types of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brenda, do you have anything you want to add to this discussion before we end? 
Well, I don't know. It's, uh, everybody's being so positive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can be negative if you want to be. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just not my style. Great, um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm thinking about uh, what you all were saying here. And, um, you know, I was thinking about the, the anti-racist, uh, you know, how to be anti-racist book by Kendi. I think I'm up uh, on. Um, uh, I'm, I'm read it a couple of times and I'm still not sure if I'm on board with him, but I am on board with him with one thing, uh, certainly that if we want to be anti-racist, we need to talk about policies and we need to talk about racist policies uh, and try to undo those policies. And so that's that's hard work because um, it's 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 not hopeful thinking. Uh, it's it's hard work of trying to lobby people in positions of power to do what's uh, what needs to be done. And so if we take a huge policy shift, like for example, school funding, uh, this is fundamental to uh, uh, this racist system, of course, uh, unequal school funding. Um, uh, and how do you change that? <laughs> uh, you know, the, the uh, people with privilege um, benefit greatly from this system and do not and will not let go of it. Um, and so there has to be strategic um, um, uh, um, organizations um, with strong leaders uh, that are trying that have to push legislators to change the system uh, state by state, uh, and that takes um, so much organization, right? And but that's how things are going to change, and that's how things have changed in the past. Um, uh, is that we've seen protests, but it's got to be followed by legislative changes. Um, and uh, that's the hard work of being anti anti racist, I think. And it's also, <laughs> you know, it, it's really difficult work. So I have a question for you. What do you find hope in? What is it that you see that allows you to feel somewhat hopeful about where we are? Oh, are you talking to me about hopefulness? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you're trying to make me be hopeful about something. Uh, 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 I, I think, I think I've been inspired. Um, I, I think I've been inspired by the uh, 2020. Mm. Um, I, uh, I'm, un I'm unhappy about a lack of leadership, uh, but I'm happy about the emotional power. Um, and I think this, the, 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 the protests were amazing. Um, and, and in some cases targeting, um, uh, problems that, that we can fix. Um, we can we can shift the way uh, police do their jobs. Um, we can we can shift uh, we can shift the police being in schools. I'm not sure that we should have uh, more NYPD police officers in New York City school systems than counselors. Um, mm -hmm. we, can, we can change that. And I was uh, this consistent power of, of, the, of the protest um, by um, in the in the protests with um, lots of different people, um, uh, you know, largely young people, but that's kind of the deal, right? Uh, and so that got me a little bit hopeful. And when I was talking with my students, I felt like my students last year were more um, wanting change uh, than than I've ever seen in my 18 years at uh, Central Methodist University, and. And so maybe that's a little bit of hope. Um, uh, maybe they're, they're, maybe that will translate into something that is actionable. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else want to talk about this this piece? Now we're kind of on this idea of hope. What are you hopeful for? What are you looking forward to? Uh, yeah, I'm in agreement with. Uh, Dr. Meyer, yeah, last year was amazing. It, just the, the amount of things that could go wrong, that did go wrong, uh, just how absolutely ridiculous things could be, the, the amount of chaos that ensued is oddly hopeful. Mm -hmm. just, I guess it just, it means the system is not set. Like there is nothing concrete about what we experienced last year. And a further read into that is there's nothing concrete about what's been established 50 years prior to that. And I think that was very, very evident in 
just the amount of things that happened, things that were very much first and foremost on the news every single day to things that didn't get talked about as much that were happening around the globe and just the the change in alliances, the change in um, appearances, the change in understanding of how things were supposed to work. Very, very chaotic year, I do not disagree, but I think in that chaos, there's, there's something beautiful about that. It's just, it lets you know that this is not forever and what you thought was probably solidified is not, it just isn't. Like, never has mm -hmm. been. And now you are very much aware of how fragile that system is. Yeah. Thank you all for reminding me that 2020 did have some in value. <laughs> never again. But yes, there were, were there was good parts about 2020, and um, just these younger generations give me hope. Uh, they're so open and willing to grow and willing to learn and not afraid to use their voices. And so I just hope they continue that and they feed off that. And, you know, that's where true change is going to come from. Mm -hmm. I'm always excited to see these babies doing all this work. It's so it may it reminds you that, like, man, you should be doing something because these kids are really killing it out here. Yeah. <laughs> they showing us up. <laughs> reminds me of the March for I Our think Lives I'm... movement that, um, you know, was started by high school kids. And, you know, I went to the uh, march in St. Mm -hmm. Louis and saw little babies there, you know, kindergartners there. Uh, and, yeah, that's where my hope is. I think my hope is in a new normal. A, this is a radical, like, probably crazy thought, but I'm tired of seeing first. I'm tired of seeing the first black <laughs> vice president. I'm ready for that to be so normal. Normal. And ordinary and mundane. That I look forward to wanting to be mundaneness of the predominant race that is white people in our country, that if you have a white doctor, it's not abnormal, it's not a white teacher. I look forward to the day that a black opera singer, a black teacher, a black astrophysicist is normal. I think mm -hmm. that's what my is, especially with this younger generation that, I mean, I look at his, um, her name and her pronouns are in her, her name mm -hmm. and those things are become normal that it's just so completely mundane and boring but i look forward to the day that me being back is boring to other people and they can just ignore me as the, the way that i look i get recognized people who don't even know who i am are like you're familiar we met and i'm like oh yeah we go back to <laughs> judy and him yeah I look forward to the day where people can pass me by, which is probably a that that's what I look forward to. That's what I look forward to. You know, if I had children, that's what, my children, I want to be normal and you know, special also, but just normal that they can just do what they want and the worry the pressure of being a first of something mm -hmm. or the second. I want there to be, oh, I'm the 712th black doctor at this hospital. That's fine. I'm just a doctor. That's that's what I look for is the, the mm -hmm. qualifiers to go away. I'm not a black opera singer. I'm an opera singer. I'm not a white pastor. I'm a pastor. And you know that's always our future. But those are the things that that gave me the hope is the normalcy that I look forward to. Mm -hmm. The normalization of blackness. Yeah. yeah, that is just, it's just nest. It's just exists. We're just here. We're just here. Yeah. That's it. Just Americans. I look forward just to the day of just Americans. And that, that takes a lot of work and a lot of time. Yeah. Woo, y'all. Thank you guys for coming and being a part of this panel discussion. It means a lot to us here at Stand Up for Equity. Um, 
I just want to thank you guys for being here and being candid and being real about how we're feeling and, and about the knowledge that we have and not being scared to bring it forth and say what what's actually happening. Um, that's kind of, it's hard today because some people are afraid to say what's real um, out, of, out of fear of, you know, disheartening someone else, being looked at by your family is, you know, what's wrong with you. Um, just being real and being here is so important to actually have the conversations, but then also helping to support us moving the pendulum of action and change, because that's what is extremely important here. And I, I do hope that when we leave here, we have some idea of what hope looks like for all of us. I think it's so important to remain hopeful. And I don't know if that is the spirit of what it means to be of color, because I think we always have this idea that we have to be hopeful about everything because it's, it's our life. And, you know, if you're not hopeful about that, then you're kind of giving up. Right. So it's I hope we all feel a sense of hope. Even Brent, I know I want you to feel hopeful, too, because you really inspired me as one of the best teachers I've ever had in my life. I don't think I would have the passion that I have for this if it weren't for you. So I hope that you feel good about the students that you're turning out and instilling change in them because you really did, you did, you do it every day and you make me want to do this all the time. Sorry. That's well, my professor. You, you're dope. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wouldn't be here without you. So I hope you feel hope in the, the, the kids you're turning out here are doing the work that you've given them the ability to do. So I, I want that for you always. So thank, thank you guys you. for being here. Um, this is a recording, so I want to let all of the people watching right now, when this goes up, uh, you can follow us at Facebook at Stand Up For Equity, Instagram and Twitter. We are on at Official S-U-F-E. Um, and also, if you like content like this, continue to support us, um, and you know, specifically with like liking our pages, following us, watching this content. But also, we appreciate monetary donations as well. We are a small organization starting off as a nonprofit here in Missouri, trying to promote equitable opportunities for all. Um, and of course, more importantly, underserved communities that, you know, equity is, is hard to come by. Um, so, you know, if you could support us monetarily, it'd be great. Um, all the things and the money that we have, you know, it, come, it will come from you guys because uh, we are a nonprofit organization here at SUFE. Again, thank you guys so much for being here, for giving us, you know, your time and your efforts and bringing your insight, and your education to the uh, platform and your experiences. It's so important. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. Have a good day, you guys. You too. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a good day, you guys. You too. Uh, thank you. Thank you guys for watching. <clears throat> if uh, anybody's still around in the stream, we are here. We are Soup. Free to take any questions that anybody might have. Type them out in the chat. Yep. If you have a question. And thank you guys for sticking around and watching this with us and being a part of our watch party. It means a lot that you guys are here and supporting us. Oh, hello, Karen. Wow, Karen. Hi, Karen. <laughs> and yeah, thanks to uh, all the panelists uh, for giving their time to uh, this video, make this video couldn't do it without them, you know? Yeah, it was a really great discourse. And I know somebody had mentioned that it was a great time to do this with them. Everyone coming from their different perspectives um, and looking at the system and looking at overall institutional racism and social injustice in our country and everyone bringing to the table their own identities. That was awesome. Something that we love to see here at SUFE. Yep. I personally loved just all of the intersections of these specific panelists. Yep. I feel like, you know, we didn't cover like every possible, you know, walk of life, but I feel like everybody was so different. I think that's really cool. Yeah. I know we have a question from Miss Karen Jeffries. It says, what are your next projects? So anybody want to take that on? <laughs> yeah, I'll go ahead and take that. Um, so the next big thing that we're doing is our book club. Um, we, we hope to carry this out uh, throughout the year, but we're reading The Watsons Go to Birmingham. Um, we're gonna break it up into a couple weeks and read a couple chapters each week. Um, <clears throat> we plan on like highlighting minority voices through this. Um, 
it's going to kind of grow and adapt as the year goes along. But every Friday, we're going to have a 30 minute sit down with all of us. Um, we're going to invite our community to come in, share their thoughts on the book. Um, we're going to have a little discourse about the themes of the book. Um, and I'm really excited to get started on that. Uh, the first sit down we're going to have is going to be on the 19th at 7 p.m. Yes, and we'll be live for that. So you guys can tune in just like you are right now and be a part of the discussion. I'm really excited for the book club. Like, I'm oh, yeah. not going to lie. Oh, yeah. That's it. Like, that's what I went to college for. I was a theater major. And so basically all we did was act and break down literature and plays and things like that. So I'm really happy to get to put those skills to use. For sure. <laughs> um, I want to give a shout out to... <laughs> I want to give a shout out to Amy Say. She says, she. I keep thinking about Deshaun's last comment. My dentist is a black female at ProDental in Columbia. Before her, I thought back and realized I had never seen a black dentist. Um, thank you for this uh, great discussion. I really enjoyed it. Shamika, you made me cry at the end. Aw. <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you for being a, being here with us and hanging out and coming in and enjoying the content. Um, yeah, we, normalizing blackness is important. It's something that we want to see where, you know, seeing a black person, I, I would, it was crazy as a black woman, as a kid, I would get so excited when I had a black teacher. I would get so excited when I had a black, you know, doctor. And I would be really excited if my black doctor was a female because it's like, oh my God, it's like a me here, you know, because you feel, you feel like these are possibilities. So the more that we have of this inclusion racially um, and even across, you know, race and gender and sexuality, the more inclusion we have, the more people feel like this is doable for them. This is real life. Like I can be a black doctor. I'll just be a doctor um, and it won't be a big deal. So normalizing blackness and seeing blackness and everything is just about normalizing what it means to be American. Americans are all kinds of people from all different walks of life and different nationalities and ethnicities. Um, and so we can normalize that, that we can normalize what it really means to look American. And being American doesn't mean you come with one standard look. And that is really important because this country is filled with different kinds of people. Um, and thank you. Yes, I'm sorry to make you cry. I mean, <laughs> that wasn't my intent. I just, I love, uh, Dr. Brent Meyer has taught me everything I know. Um, I wouldn't be sitting, I wouldn't be doing anything, honestly, probably if it wasn't for him and Dr. Gold at CMU, uh, because they really are the change makers on that campus uh, when it concerns social justice and looking at psychology and the importance of, of people. That's what they do. They talk and their whole majors and their whole degrees are in, in people. Um, and so that's what we do here. You know, being first and foremost a humanitarian is important. So when I hear, I want him to always feel hopeful about what he's doing because he does great work at CMU and he inspires every year a different number of graduates who are leaving that campus. He definitely inspires me every day. I think about, I hear him every day. He will, you know, just thinking about, oh, the Thomas principle and what that means and talking about intersectionality, that all came from Dr. Brent Meyer. So I wouldn't know the vernacular. I wouldn't know anything about this field. I wouldn't have the passion if it weren't for him and Dr. Gold. So big ups to them always. And we wouldn't be anywhere without Shamika. So that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's the domino effect. <laughs> so Brent and Dr. Gold are inspiring us in this moment. Amen. Anything else that you guys want to talk about? They are gems, yes. <laughs> CMU can never, ever lose them because you lost a good thing if you do. Word to CMU. <laughs> so I also wanted to talk a little bit about some other things that we do have coming up and what we're doing already. Um, Sam mentioned the, the book club, but also we're highlighting Black-owned businesses this month. And we've been turning them out every single day, new business every single day, sometimes a couple of businesses a day. Um, and we've been doing getting through that. So that's really important work for us here at SUFE, not just highlighting black voices, but also highlighting black business because we know that economic um, ability opportunities is really important to help sustain a community that's underserved and underrepresented and doesn't have the the economic equity that some other communities do. So it's so important to talk about black owned businesses. It's such a, a great thing to have a black owned business because it's very difficult in the black community to be able to establish yourself in that way. So 
definitely want to be an assistance to that community and, you know, my community and helping them to get um, their voice out and being able to get their businesses out and help them to gain, you know, economic prosperity and wealth. And that's what, you know, we're all about here at SUFE. And if you've missed any of those posts that we've made highlighting these black women businesses, please go back to our Facebook page. We have uh, a bunch of great businesses, uh, of diversity in uh, what the business is, all black owned. Um, and I know I've started to patronize some of these places that I didn't know existed. And I'm excited to get to try some of these things out and make That's a difference awesome. in that community. And I think the ultimate goal for this project is to not only carry it past February, but also create a permanent um, directory on our website of black owned businesses that um, can live there and be updated as we find new black owned businesses um, and build our community. Uh, just so we have that resource that we can share. If you didn't know, our website is standupforequity.org. You can go in there. There's a lot of great information on the five of us. Um, what we stand for as an organization, uh, why we focus on equity, uh, specifically what we believe equity means to us. Uh, so a lot of great resources there. You can uh, volunteer, you can sign up uh, to receive notifications on us. You can donate, which is very important. Yeah, and we are on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we're on Instagram. So on my Instagram, we are at our Instagram is official at S U F E, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I always like to say, tells me everything. Yes. <laughs> and then it's the same for Twitter as well. So we can put that in the comments uh, just so people can help follow us with social media. That'd be great. Um, and of course, we're on Facebook at um, Stand Up for Equity. So just the full name, Stand Up for Equity. Thank you so much. TikTok coming soon. TikTok will be here eventually. Yes. <laughs> oh Lord, TikTok. <laughs> We're going to be required to do that. Um, yes. Uh, just want to thank you, Ashley Blazer, for coming out. She says thanks so much hey. for providing this space for discussion and insight on others' perspectives. It's so valuable. Really looking forward to following this organization. Thank you for um, your continued support. It's going to mean a lot for us. <laughs> thank you, Bima, for coming out. That's my sister. She, anytime my my Greek family shows up, my Greek, uh, you know, sisters here here, I want to shout them out. They're so supportive. It makes me so happy to see people from all of our own individual walks of life. From you know when we were in high school, from we went all went to college together. We're now in the professional world. Like all these people come together to support us is really cool, and I think it's indicative of the work that we're trying to do across all different communities. It's very important. And Bima says John is all grown up now. And I was like, he sure is. <laughs> he tries to be. Yeah. Yes. For so for you guys who are in the chat on you know Facebook, we did just put our Facebook and our Twitter and Insta handles. Uh please follow us and you know, like, comment on our things, um, engage with us, be active with us. We really want that. Um, you know, and if you want to volunteer, let us know. And if you want to give, we are so beyond thankful for anything you want to contribute to us. We are a small organization, and we just are thankful for anything that we can get. It means a lot. You guys mean a lot to us. As soon as uh, the pandemic lightens up a little bit, uh, we are going to have, we're going to be planning some events that volunteers will be needed for. So if that's something that you, yeah, here in Columbia, if that's something that you think you'd be interested in, uh, it's never too early to sign up for that, so you can be in the mix. We can get in contact with you when that comes down the road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love you, Bima. She just said she loves us. <laughs> want to shout her out. <laughs> yes, if you guys have anything else, anybody else want to add anything, want to expand on anything, we're here. Um, and, you know, just want to talk. You, we're here. If you have some questions left over from that discussion that you might not have understood or you wanted to expand on or you wanted to talk about, put it in the chat um, and we'll address it. And if it's something that you don't feel comfortable putting in the chat, you can always send us a direct message. Definitely. For we sure. all manage that. We can, we can get back in touch with you like that, too. Yeah. And thanks to Sam, my response time is good. So <laughs> you can trust. We will get back sure. to you. <laughs> I know that in the in the discussion there was a lot of stuff about white allyship that we talked about. How do you guys feel about it? 
because I know we've been having. I feel know, like it's very important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We talk amongst ourselves all the time. We just have like we had a meeting before this and just talking about, you know, the difference between like white allyship versus white savership. And that is so important to talk about when we're going into spaces where we're going to serve underserved communities that are already marginalized and ostracized. So that is so important. We have a discussion of what it means to walk with people of color and not lead people of color. Um, giving communities their ability to manage themselves because they can, because they've been doing it for a while. It's just that they, you know, coming from a community, the black community myself, it's just that we haven't had the economic opportunities, the, you know, the opportunities that come with the privilege that is, you know, just lacking in our communities. But we are definitely capable of leading ourselves. However, it's so important to have white allyship and any kind of allyship for support because it helps to build on what we don't have. So, we're definitely here at SUFE are talking about the things that are real and checking our own privilege here, checking ourselves and being you know, accountable to ourselves and transparent. So that's something that we definitely believe and something that we want to continue moving forward as an organization. Absolutely. Well, if nobody else has any other questions, I think that about does it for tonight. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. You guys Definitely are awesome. If you, if you guys like what we're doing tonight, uh, like we said, we'll be back next Friday, breaking down the Watsons go to Birmingham. First three chapters. I'm super excited to, to get into that and then uh, help everybody break it down. Break it down. Break it down. And if you guys want to read you know, this book along with us, get it and you know, come to the live and we can have a discussion. You can put it in and we'll address it. It'll be something that we can build on with content. Uh, but definitely be a part of what we have going on. And, and thank you guys to, for coming out. If you find it, try to check it out uh, on a local business instead of uh, just getting it through Amazon. If you can, that would yeah. always be. Check out your area for local black owned yeah. bookstores. Yes. And Bima just asked, will we be live for that? Yes, we will. Yes, we will. It's all live, live, local, and lit. So we'll be here. <laughs> we'll be here doing it uh, on live, and you guys can watch and, and be engaging with us uh, throughout the discussion, just like we are right now. And we'll be breaking it down, as John said, just going through the chapters and you know what we're learning from each piece. So um, we'll be here. So yeah, please come. Bring your friends. Tell your friends. Tell your yeah. friends. Share Tell your family. Yeah. Tell your enemies. <laughs> tell everybody. Tell everybody. There, there, there are some people that we need to reach the most. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> tell them. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for coming out again. Thank you it means so much, a lot. Yeah. Is there a black owned bookstore in Como? When we looked it up, I don't think we saw any, but there was. We're, we're ordering from a store in University City, right? Mm -hmm. um, I see. Me. I know there's some in Kansas City as well, but. As far as we know, I don't. We don't think there is any black-owned bookstores in Columbia. Specifically, no. There is the Peace Nook, which might own, uh, which might have copies of it uh, downtown, but they they are not specifically black-owned. Well, we had our conversation on uh, on the radio with Laura Wacker. She said that the Peace Nook was offering twenty-five percent off uh, yeah. books that deal with uh, the black experience during February. Uh, for the month of February. So even if it's not the Watsons go to Birmingham, even if they don't have that, go to the Peace Nook, get you, get you some literature to read. They do good things around the community. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys for being here. We love to see you guys on the 19th when we go live again, talking about the next Watsons Friday. go to Birmingham. Next Friday. Uh, next Friday. Um, and we'll be here. Come and hang with us as we dissect this book. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.